distinguished audience from the Ministry of Welfare, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and sponsored by Kitty and KOFIH. I am Kwon Man from the Graduate School of Public Health of Seoul National University, who will be moderating this session around the world. Many people are going through challenges because of COVID-19. Korea is no exception. And in late February and early March, we had many confirmed cases. However, Korea was very quick in effectively responding to this crisis. And we are very effectively controlling the virus spreading. And many countries around the world are interested in Korea's experience. Today's webinar will be about how Korea was able to effectively respond to COVID-19, what kind of policies we used, and what kind of challenges we had, and how the experts in public health and the medical sector responded to this crisis. That is the purpose of our webinar today, to share our experience with everyone. And we want to share with you uh, what we actually went through and what was effective so that the world can have very effective strategies to deal with COVID-19. We have four experts who are here with us, and they will be delivering presentations. And before the presentations, I would like to invite the Vice Minister Kim kang lib of Ministry of Health and Welfare to give opening remarks. Respect with public health authorities and officials around the globe, it is very meaningful to get together at this webinar at a time when we need to cooperate more closely. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak, the world is faced with an unprecedented crisis. This reminds us again of the fact that we are living in the community of common destiny where we are interconnected as we band together and exchange each other. To fight against the COVID-19 19 epid uh, epidemic pandemic, we established a response system for the infectious diseases with a new concept that suits well to the democracy based on globalization and diversification. We have been putting all efforts to stop the spread of the virus while maintaining international travel and exchanges as much as possible. We protected both Koreans and foreigners without discrimination from the threat of the virus. Central and local governments worked together, and healthcare professionals and citizens actively cooperated with the government. In addition, we are making the most out of our competencies by fully exercising creativity and using the technology. In managing the confirmed cases and their contacts, we actively use IT and implemented safe and rapid testing practice, such as drive-through and walk-through and local stage, uh, screening stations. By making such diverse efforts, we now see the number of new confirmed cases to be stabilized. However, we believe it is still too early to relax, so we will continue with our response efforts. Until vaccines and treatment are developed, it will be difficult to go back to the kind of daily life that we had before. We have to prepare for the new normal that is sustainable. We are moving from strong social distancing to the distancing in daily life. It is time for us to remain alert and make concerted efforts to protect the community until we are able to see each other in person through webinars and video conferencing. We will exchange experience and information with public health officials and healthcare professionals around the world in a timely manner. As we say in the social distancing campaign, we are far apart but close at heart. We are far apart, but we are living in the community of common destiny, and we can will overcome this crisis together by cooperating and being united together. Thank you very much. It was Vice Minister Kang Lip Kim of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Thank you very much for your opening remarks. I would like to introduce our presenters. In Korea's response to COVID-19, we had many effective policies. There were some characteristics of those policies. To note, there were many tests that were done in a short amount of time so that we actually uncovered the confirmed cases very quickly and we also traced 
the confirmed cases so that we had very effective epidemiological investigations that were completed. So we had a very well-functioning system. Today we have four experts here with us. and. First, uh, we have somebody who is in the front lines of our fight against COVID-19, Director General Son young ne and we are going to have Director Hong Gi-ho, who will be talking about the different test kits. We are also going to hear about preparedness and response to COVID-19 from Professor Moran Ki from National Cancer Center. And we're going to hear from Professor Kim Usok of um, Seoul National University Pundang Hospital, who is going to talk about the hospital infection experience. Regarding the first uh, presentation, uh, we are going to invite Director General of Strategy Planning from Central Disaster Management Headquarters, Sun Young Ne, and he will be covering how the national policy on COVID-19 response and current status. It's my pleasure to meet you online. I am Young Le Soon, responsible for strategy and planning for the COVID-19 outbreak. Today, uh, I will share Korea's national policy and response on the COVID-19 outbreak. Well, public uh, health care system and national systems against infectious diseases are varying among countries depending on their social cultural traits. So I cannot say that our experience and system is universally fitting, but I hope that our experience help you in responding the outbreak in your country. Let me share the chronological trend in the number of cases. After the first case was confirmed on January 20th until February 18th, the situation was relatively stable with a new daily case being about one. But on the uh, 18th of uh, February, the patient 31st was confirmed, who was the member of the Chincheonji Church. Since then, the number of the new cases rapidly increased. And 10 days after that, daily new cases rose to 813. And since then, it picked out. And on uh, March 28th, the discharged cases outnumbered active cases. As of April 30, 1,593 patients were being uh, treated under isolation, and 8,922 8 patients are discharged. And as of the same day, the total number of the confirmed cases is 10,761, and among them, uh, 8,922 uh, 8, patients are discharged, and 1,593 are isolated, and 246 patients are deceased. This year, testings are done for uh, 614,197 uh, persons, and of them, about 1.8 percent are found to be positive. And uh, by region, Daegu and Gyeongbuk, these two regions have most of the confirmed cases, with about 82,000 patients. And this can be contributed to the cluster infection in a specific religious group called Shincheonji Church in Daegu. And they have about 7,000 people to be infected with the virus. Next is age and death distribution of the confirmed cases. As pointed, mass infection caused by Shincheonji Church was significant. And their cases occupy about two-thirds of all confirmed cases in Korea. And because of that, by age, people in 20s account for a noticeable majority. Case fatality rate is about 2.32%, which is relatively lower than that of other countries. However, the pattern is similar to those of other countries, meaning that the older group of patients experience higher uh, fatality rate than younger group. In particular, CFR for patients in 80s is 25%, for patients in 70s, 11%. Uh, for patients in 60s comes close to the average uh, with 2.5%, and patients in 50 uh, point 8% in patients younger than 40, under 0.2%. Next is public health uh, response and its governance structure. For Korea, KCDC or Korean CDC is an independent expert body to control infectious diseases. In times of novel infectious disease outbreak, it serves as the command center and exercises leadership in national response against the disease. The government, meantime, is reorganized to provide support to KCDC 
And currently, under the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Health and Welfare mobilizes health care resources and pan-government organization coordinates supports across the government and regional local governments and municipal government organize local bodies for call response. KCDC, the central government and local governments are holding meetings every day and closely cooperate together. In addition, detailed information such as the number of new confirmed cases and risk levels are shared rapidly, and inquiries are handled through a designated call center and public health centers in communities. The government provides guidelines on infectious disease prevention and control, such as keeping a distance of 1 to 2 meters, and citizens are well practicing them. Next is actions taken at the each stage in public health response. First, when a new case is identified, Identified. Fast and accurate epidemiological investigation is conducted. At this stage, information and communication technology is utilized in tracing the person's whereabouts and sharing uh, such information with citizens. Identify of information about the patient is not disclosed, and after a certain time period, disclosed information is deleted from the public domain. And the contact of the infected persons are unidentified as fast as possible and self-isolated. It is really important to stem the spread of COVID-19. The second stage is early detection. Korea expanded PCR diagnostic testing competencies early on and established a large number of local screening stations. By doing so, we can test many people at a rapid pace. COVID-19 causes infection even when a patient is asymptomatic or has only mild symptoms. That's why we expanded the testing. For example, if a person working in a uh, densely populated facility is confirmed for the virus, then everyone on the relevant floor, even in that building, whole building, is tested. And if a new confirmed case is found in a hospital or a facility for seniors, all patients, seniors, and staff at the premise are tested. By having such expanded diagnostic testing, asymptomatic patients and uh, those early in the onset are identified, isolated. For treatment, it's really important to classify patients depending on the severity. The COVID-19 spreads fast and infects many people. And at the same time, many people have mild symptoms and do not need hospitalization. So if all infected persons are to be hospitalized, the health care system will collapse. During the early days of the outbreak, Korea didn't know about this, so had a difficult time in effectively utilizing health care resources. However, with better understanding about the virus, we changed the treatment system. So patients with the serious cases, which are about 10% of the total, are sent to hospitals, but the remaining 90% who have no symptoms or only mild symptoms checked into the living treatment centers for isolation where a small number of medical staff care for them. This approach spares hospitals from being overrun with patients. It is also important to have stable health care system for non-COVID-19 uh, patients. So movement tests of patients with respiratory symptoms and those without are separated at designated public safe hospital. And also medical consultation by telephone is temporarily allowed for non-COVID-19 patients. <laughs> Lastly, Korea has, does not ban international entry. However, a special entry procedure is put in place under which all entrants need to verify domestic contact number and download a self-health check application. And when people arrived from other countries visit hospitals, their travel histories are provided to the uh, medical institutions. And this slide shows major response plotted in timeline as the number of the COVID-19 patients and confirmed cases among incoming arrivals increase on 28 January, the infected disease alert was raised to orange, which is the second highest alert. Korea has a level, a four-level alert system, uh, and on January 28, it was raised to the third highest level. And from February 7, the scope of the testing was expanded as the testing can be done based on the physician's judgment. At the time, the number of the confirmed cases only was only somewhere around 20. But after the patient uh, 31st was confirmed confirmed on February 18, the number of the two confirmed cases rose sharply every day in double digit. So the alert level was raised to the highest one, and the pan government response support system was established. After learning that the increase was linked to the Chinchanji church in Daegu, from February 20, 9,000 worshippers of Chinchanji church 
were isolated and tested for the virus. And on February 29, the social distancing campaign was mounted asking citizens to stay home. As seen in the decrease of people movement to the 50% uh, of the previous level, Korean citizens actively supported with the government policy. Although 5,000 uh, were newly confirmed in 10 days, 90 of them, 90% of them are mild cases now requiring hospitalization. So after learning that, we or reorganized the system for treatment. So the mild cases were sent to living treatment centers and carried by a small number of health professionals. With such efforts, the peak of the first wave uh, dropped. Now the daily new case is stabilized to single digit. And starting from uh, May 6, we increase economic activity and practice daily routines while keeping distance in daily life. We implement everyday life quarantine. Next slide highlights the number of the lab testing. Korea's daily capacity for PCR testing is 20,000. Turnaround time is 6 hours to 24 hours. The testing will be explained in more detail later, so I will skip it here. Next is quarantine and special entry procedure. As explained, Korea does not shut down, close its border, and does not ban international travels except for those from Hubei, China. However, we implement special entry procedure. Upon arrival, all entrants have to verify domestic contact number and download self-health check mobile application. And then using this web app, uh, they have to submit their health check result twice a day for 14 days. And this information is sent to the disease control authority. And if symptoms are suspected, the authority contacts the entrant and informs the person of the nearly testing site and asks the person to get tested. With this procedure, Korea has been able to effectively control infection from international rivals without restricting entry. However, as this is a worldwide pandemic, from April 1st, all entrants have to self-isolate for self-quarantine for 14 days after arrival. Lastly, let me summarize the characteristics of Korean uh, response system. First, Korea did not control borders and did not lock down business establishment or restrict economic activities to the level seen in other countries. Rather, we focused on identifying a high-risk group who contacted the infected persons. Citizens voluntarily participated in the social distancing movement. Second, the government acted transparently by providing information via briefings uh, twice a day, and citizens displayed a high level of civic engagement, not panicked, and not hoarding supplies in the market. The public voluntarily participated in the social distancing movement, which achieves similar effects of the lockdown in other countries. Third, Korea offers universal health coverage and a healthcare system with good access. Testing and treatment for the COVID-19 infection are free of charge thanks to the universal healthcare system and government support. This applies not only to Koreans but also to foreign nationals in Korea. Such system allows us to find, isolate, and treat the infected people and helps to stem the spread of disease. Fourth, strong cooperation was forged among different departments of the central government and between the central and local governments. In addition, the healthcare community and the public work together with the government making all our efforts to control the outbreak. Lastly, advanced technologies were fully utilized to craft effective and creative countermeasures. When we deal with unknown diseases such as novel virus infection, we do not know much about it in the beginning. As we learn about the disease during the course of the response, we have to exercise creativity to come up with the efficient measures. In this sense, Korea successfully utilized cutting-edge technologies to develop creative solutions. So far, I briefly explained Korea's response to the COVID-19 outbreak. More details on each area of response will be shared by following speakers.
As I said in the beginning, we all have different healthcare systems and social cultural backgrounds and situations. So what we hear today may not perfectly fit to your situation, but still I hope this helps you in responding you better to the pandemic more effectively. I hope that this helps you in re your response. Thank you very much. He is in the front lines of the policies and he has actually shared with us his real life experience. Thank you, Director General Son. So the main point in this presentation is that the role of the central government and the cooperation between the central and local governments and between the government and the public, and also the strength of the uh, universal health coverage. By utilizing this kind of the resources, Korea has been effectively responding against the COVID-19. I would like to invite our second speaker, and he will be talking about the COVID-19 testings and what role that has played in Korea. I would like to invite from Seoul Medical Center Director Ki Ho Hung his presentation regarding COVID-19 tests. Greetings, I am Kyo Hong, Director of the Department of Laboratory Medicine at the Seoul Medical Center. I am working as a member of the COVID-19 Task Force at the Korean Society for Laboratory Medicine. It is a great honor for me to elaborate on COVID-19 laboratory testing to you from all over the globe. In a situation where there is COVID-19 pandemic all over the world, the first step is testing. It's because without testing, you cannot know whether COVID-19 exists or not. That's why accurate, rapid and massive testing should be the first step. Today, I will cover what kind of tests we should choose, how to perform the tests, the basics, and some considerations. COVID-19 lab testing, like other viruses, can be categorized into three types. They are virus isolation, molecular assay, and immunoassay. In the case of virus isolation, since living viruses are handled, it is very dangerous and quite slow, so it is quite impractical. So that is why molecular assays are most widely used. It is quite accurate and most effective in diagnosing acute infections. When there are newly emerging viruses, you can develop a new testing method in a relatively short amount of time. However, it is quite expensive, and you need to use specific devices, which can be a drawback. On the other hand, immunoassay method is relatively lower in price, but relatively less accurate, and it takes relatively a longer amount of time to develop a reliable testing kit. It can be largely divided into antigen and antibody test. Antigen method has very low sensitivity, so that it is only used when molecular assay method cannot be used. Antibody method is to detect the antibody that the human body produces after getting infected with the virus, but it takes two to three weeks for the antibody to be formed, so it cannot be used to diagnose acute infections, but only for epidemiological investigations and diagnosing past and asymptomatic infections. This is a graph comparing the positive rate for different testing methods according to when the symptom onset occurred. Before system, symptom onset, Onset, most testing methods cannot be used, and one week after symptom onset, some virus molecular assay methods can be used. After sim symptom onset, it turns into acute infection, and virus molecular assay can be used. And after about three weeks, the virus exits the body, and the virus molecular method may not detect the virus. Some may be cultivated in the stool, but the positive rate is much lower, and generally respiratory specimens will be used. Antibody method, as a form will generally show a positive response two to three weeks after symptoms have occurred. Looking at the basics of the molecular test, it is to detect the specific unique nucleic, nucleic acid in all living things, DNA and RNA. It only detects the unique genetic sequences, so there is high specificity. It also amplifies the nucleic acids. Acids, in theory, 40 cycles can amplify one copy into one trillion copies, so there 
with high specificity. There are many types of molecular assays. The most widely used is real-time polymerase chain reaction, the real-time PCR, as we abbreviate. This is the real-time PCR device and reagent that you are seeing on the screen. Let us find out what is needed to perform molecular tests in a mass outbreak situation. First, before the outbreak, you need to have the facilities, devices, and foster professional medical experts. For the facilities, you need an isolated lab and biosafety cabinets and other facilities. For devices, they would be PCR equipment, and you would need to train medical experts who can perform and interpret tests. After the mass outbreak, you would need to have a large amount of reliable test kits. At that time, it is better to use commercial kits that have stable quality compared to the lab-developed test kits. In addition, you would need plans to overcome the many deficiencies of the kits since they were made in a hurry. Other than the kits, you would need swabs, packaging boxes, masks, and other safety equipment. Another important point would be close cooperation and communication between the different organizations that are using the kits the government, experts from private public sector, and the academia and the kit manufacturers would need to work closely together and communicate. Through the cooperation, you would need to develop strategies about how to use the kits and develop guidelines to overcome the technical issues. Korea experienced the 2009 influenza pandemic and thus sufficient numbers of PCR devices, the thermocyclers were distributed, and molecular diagnosis became widely used, and that is why we developed the capabilities in this area. In Korea, we have many medical specialists, MDs, who are professionals in laboratory medicine. They have professional knowledge and developed, interpreted, and read, read the kits from a very medical professional view. The Korea Society for Laboratory Medicine, comprised of these professionals, have a laboratory inspection and accreditation program to access the quality of labs and through National External Quality Control Program, was able to maintain the quality of the test so mass molecular assay testing was possible. There are many guidelines about what PCR kits to choose. There are many protocols for target genes of E, R, D, R, P, N, N, S. WHO is recommending that for areas with no known COVID-19 virus circulation, at least two different targets are used, or one positive NAAT result and sequencing is analyzed. However, in the case of areas with established COVID-19 virus circulation, screening by RT-PCR of a single discriminatory target is possible. One or more negative results do not rule out the possibility of COVID-19 because there could be a quality problem problem of the specimen or a specimen transport problem. It could be very early or late stage of COVID-19, and there could be technical problems, such as PCR inhibition. So WHO is strongly recommending that one specimen's one or more negative results do not rule out the possibility of COVID-19. These are some protocols for COVID-19 tests used around the world, and you can see the kits that have been developed by Korean companies on the screen. What kind of kits should we choose? Actually, not all kits have very good quality. You can generally trust the kits that received Korea EUA, Emergency Use Approval by Korea, MFDS, Ministry of Food and Drug Safety. However, it is true that some kits are exported without evaluation by Korean experts. So you should check as much information as possible for the reliable Kits. They can be manufacturer's documents, national EUA documents, and especially important is whether reliable academic papers have evaluation reports for the kits. Currently, there are many research results for COVID-19, and some results are not published in academic journals but as preprints, so you should take precaution that some of the results might not be reliable. To look into Korea's EUA process, based on the 2015 MERS experience, Korea established the EUA system for the I-5 
HIV-D kits. However, what is more important is to quickly take action after the EUA is given. With the novel COVID-19 outbreak, KCDC and KSLM have evaluated the PCR test kits together, and MFDS approved the kits based on their evaluation results under EUA. This took place in late January, so there was a simplified evaluation since there was little time then. We needed to overcome the limitations of simplified evaluation, and many measures were taken. First, only the laboratories that were accredited for molecular tests by KLMF were able to perform COVID-19 testing. KSLM trained labs with COVID-19 virus and testing method information. In addition, all labs needed to pass the EQA program before testing, and after the tests, collected and analyzed the results of the tests and checked if there were abnormal results. A number of methods were developed to overcome the limitations. As a part of these methods, COVID-19 testing guideline and Q&A was developed. The testing method was first developed in February, and an English version has been developed, so everyone around the world can use them if needed. There are testing methods, when to test, how to collect the specimens and transport the specimens, how to interpret test results, and much more included in the guideline. There is also a FAQ, and an English version will soon be released, so it will be available for use for everyone around the world. One important Q&A among the different questions that we are getting is that retesting is always very important. Values close to the cutoff values in specimens with low viral loads may indicate false negative or false positive results. That is why a lab physician should interpret the results and, if needed, retest using residual or new specimens. This is most important, and you can see a real-time example on the screen. Before the retest, it was suspected as a positive test, but after the retest, you can see the results show that it was below the standard, so it was deemed not positive. That is why I recommend that if there is an ambiguous case, you should always Retest. I have been talking about the general real-time PCR test, and I will now turn the subject to other tests. There is a method called rapid molecular assay method, and it exists. It is not being adopted in earnest in Korea yet, but in the U.S., Efeid, Biomerium, Skuazen, and Abbott have these methods. In principle, they use real-time PCR or isothermal amplification, so it is not very different from the aforementioned method, but, is, but it is optimized for special cartridge and devices. So an advantage is that it has a turnaround time of less than 60 minutes. So it's very quick, and the accuracy can be comparable to the general, general real-time PCR. However, the disadvantage is that although general real-time PCR kits are very expensive, this method is more expensive, and for some kits, one can cost up to 700 euros. In addition, it uses its own specific devices. So in most cases, there is only one test per device, which is possible. So you will need many tests as well as many devices for numerous tests. That is why this cannot be used generally, but suitable in a limited way, such as in emergency rooms or in as pre-operation tests. These are some real kits, and some evaluation results have been published. And in cases with low viral load, it seems that there is some difference in the performance. Immunoassay method, as I aforementioned, is not recommended for acute infections. KSLM, WHO, Infectious Diseases Society of America, and US CDC all clearly recommend not to use immunoassay methods for acute infections. Johns Hopkins University states that antibody levels have not been correlated with immunity, while people who have been infected are presumed to have some in immunity. It is unclear for how much and how long it will last. Also, 
that there has not been a formal evaluation of some serology tests, and some reports have raised concerns about the validity of serology tests, so they firmly recommend not to use serology tests. There are rapid tests for immunoassays and WHO and UK National COVID Testing Scientific Advisory Panel make it clear that these tests cannot be used because they are not well performing. However, the US FDA has had the EUA for some of these types of kits. And another type is the enzyme immunoassay, or EIA. In this case, EIA in most cases showed a higher sensitivity than rapid tests in most studies. In the US, eight to nine kits have received a EUA. And through meta-analysis, sensitivity was around 82% and specificity was around 95%. So it was reported to have good performance, but there was a high heterogeneity between the kits, and the positive predictive value was not higher than 90%. In addition, there needs to be specific devices for EIA, although not as specialized as PCR and molecular assays, so there are limitations. In addition, as mentioned previously, it takes at least two weeks for the infection to be diagnosed as positive, so it cannot be used for acute infections. To summarize, molecular testing should be the main diagnosing tool for COVID-19, and other assays can only be used in a limited fashion. It takes a lot of investment for molecular testing, but it is worth the investment to protect your country and your people from COVID-19. COVID-19 testing needs professionalism, cooperation, and communication. We hope and believe that all clinical labs in the world will contribute to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. Last but not least, this was published recently, and it was found that the short diagnosing serial interval of COVID-19 in South Korea may explain why South Korea was able to contain the COVID-19 outbreak and avoid high mortality. This was uh, recently disclosed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Director Hong talked about the importance of the test kits and he talked about the Korean case where we had a lower fatality and lower confirmed cases because of the test kits and what kind of process Korea followed. And he also talked about how we improved the quality of the different tests and the results. And he mentioned the merits and demerits of different types of tests. Thank you very much for your presentation. The next presentation will be about uh, after when a patient is diagnosed with COVID-19, how to treat these types of patients. So I would like to invite Professor Lee Seok Kim from Seoul National University Bundang Hospital to give a presentation. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. I'm Lisa Kim, Chief of Infection Control Office at Seoul National University Bundang Hospital. Today I will share SNU Bundang Hospital's infection control and preparedness, which complies KCDC guideline, and also present our clinical cases. SNU Bundang Hospital is a tertiary hospital located in Seoul metropolitan area with 1,300 beds. After the MERS outbreak in 2015, we have been operating isolation units supported and designated by the government. We conduct screening and triage at the AD or the emergency department entrance, and we have a system where patients with novel infectious diseases are separated from other patients. As the COVID-19 outbreak spreads, we established a temporary negative pressure unit outside of the building and entrance to the hospital is controlled to screen people with fever or respiratory symptoms and also disallow them to enter the hospital building. Screening is conducted on all entrance at the hospital entrance and also at ED. Simple questionnaire is filled and also the temperature is checked. Those who do not have specific epidemiological risk factors, they are sent to the COVID-19 clinic outside of the hospital and those with risk factors are screened in the ED. All visitors to the hospital must wear face mask. Before entering the building, they have to fill in questionnaire and also be checked for their temperature. 
Only those who pass this screening are allowed to de enter the hospital. This screening work is done by administrative staffs wearing a disposable gown, globe, and a dental mask. And the flow of people through the entrance is controlled for the screening process, so people should move one way. And this is a questionnaire that all visitors and patients must fill at the entrance. Only those who answer no for all questions can receive a daily entry pass and they have to carry it in the hospital. The color of this pass changes every day. People with fever or respiratory symptoms must wear face masks and visit the COVID-19 clinic located outside of the hospital building. Healthcare professionals wearing protective gears conduct triage and when needed conduct diagnostic imaging or PCR testing for COVID-19. In the COVID-19 clinic, a patient is examined by a doctor and when needed to have PCR testing, the patient moves to the sampling room through an airlock area equipped with a movable negative pressure system. And after that, the patient should leave the clinic using exit-only doors. So the patient flow is one way, and therefore aerosols in the sampling room cannot move to the airlock or the examination room. In ED, all patients and visitors are triaged at the entrance, and those without risk factors and symptoms are sent to the general ED area. And those who have risk factors or symptoms, they are sent to the isolation unit, and this process is managed by ED the nurses. After the COVID-19 outbreak, the emergency room is separated by door to have an isolated area. And patients are classified based on a risk level and assigned to isolation rooms when needed. All staff in this area wear N95 respirator, gloves, and gown. And procedures that may induce aerosol like PCR testing are done. They also wear a facial shield or Google or level the protective gown. For patients admitted, we have three categories of units. The National Inpatient Isolation Unit designated by the government for the emerging infectious diseases has nine beds and are used for the severe cases of COVID-19. And a respiratory disease ward was renovated to have 11 beds from 35 beds and installed with a movable negative pressure system for moderate COVID-19 uh, cases. One general ward reduced its number of the beds and is operated as preemptive isolation unit for patients with pneumonia of known unknown cause or with epidemiologic risk. National inpatient isolation unit has patient flow completely separated from that of other patients, implementing high-level isolation, ventilator care, ECMO, renal replacement therapy, or any other treatment for the crit critically ill patients can be done inside. Generally, this unit is used for patients suspected of the emerging infectious diseases such as MERS or Ebola that are confirmed from time to time, but currently it receives the patients with a severe COVID-19 infection transferred from hospitals in Gyeonggi province and treat them. In this unit, healthcare professionals are ready to care critical patients and the central monitoring is done at the nurse station. Each room has an airlock and the room is spacious enough to accommodate equipment necessary to treat critically ill patients. PPE dunning and doffing rooms are separated to prevent cross-contamination, and an infection management nurse monitors the dunning and doffing process in order to, to keep medical staff safe. The unit for respiratory diseases had three negative pressure areas in the past. The other area in the unit were renovated to have additional beds with a movable negative pressure system and PEE donning and doffing rooms. And these areas are physically separated from the nurse's station uh, and can accommodate up to 11 moderate COVID-19 patients for treatment.
Other than that, in the general world, three negative pressure rooms are prepared to preemptively isolate patients who are not strongly suspected but need to rule out the COVID-19 infection and also to collect respiratory samples. And in other rooms in the world, patients with atypical pneumonia or asymptomatic patients with epidemiological risk are isolated or managed as a cohort. In addition, in order to prevent the transmission of pathogens in hospital, examination and prescription can be offered through the telephone temporarily. Hospital staff who treat or contact the COVID-19 patients or visit high-risk areas have to stop working immediately if they have symptoms suspected of a COVID-19 uh, infection and they have to self-isolate themselves in their homes. They can have PCR testing in ED before that and usually see the result in 24 hours and they are allowed to return to work only when they are tested negative. We send daily e-questionnaires via smartphone regarding their fever and respiratory symptoms to all medical staff for self-check and receive answers. If there are suspected symptoms, then the public health manager of the hospital will contact the person and conduct another evaluation. If there is a possibility of COVID-19, the person will immediately be banned from work and receive a PCR test. In addition, we send routine text messages to the medical staff who are participating in the COVID-19 patient cases and conduct active monitoring for the symptoms. All medical staff mandatorily have to wear surgical masks in the hospital at all times and to block crowding and droplet infection in the cafeteria while eating, we added blocking panels. The face-to-face -face conferences held in the hospital have been substituted with teleconferences and we have trained our staff to adhere to social distancing. For the appropriate robing and disrobing of protective suits of the medical staff treating and confirmed and suspected COVID-19 patients, the Division of Infectious Diseases carried out intensive training so there could be safe treatments in a real situation. And in labs, operating rooms, delivery rooms, and angiogram rooms, we created scenarios and carry out simulations regarding treatment as of suspected patients, CPR, and course management. To prevent shutdown of medical facilities when there is an overflow of patients, among the stable patients that have completed acute stage treatment and have no comorbidities, we transported them to a living treatment center in the outskirts of Gyeonggi province that we established together with Gyeonggi province so that isolation can be maintained and basic monitoring and PCR tests for discharge could be provided with a minimum number of medical staff so that we can most efficiently use the resources of our medical facility. The patients who are admitted to the living treatment center have daily self-checks using smartphone apps for temperature, oxygen saturation, and other medical monitoring. We have a system for telecommunication and telemedicine between patients and physicians at the operating HQ at SNU Bundang Hospital, and prescriptions can be given if needed by the doctors remotely. In Gyeonggi province, there is a treatment system according to the severity of the COVID-19 patients. First entering on the SNU Bundang Hospital, in the five tertiary hospitals in the province, the serious patients are treated. We have a system where all public medical institutions, including Gyeonggi Provincial Medical Center and Songnam Citizens Medical Center, can be emptied to be devoted to the treatment of mild COVID-19 patients. And as aforementioned, for the COVID-19 stable patients who have passed the acute phase, to maintain isolation and to monitor them until discharge, in the outskirts of Gyeonggi province, we have a living treatment center established and our hospital mainly operated this center. We established a referral system for different facilities so the local autonomous government was able to efficiently use its medical resources. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. In treating the confirmed cases, we have learned how the hospitals are treating them. And in very detail, we also learn how the hospitals prevent the infection within the hospital. It's not just about the uh, treatment of the patients, but at the same time, when we have the confirmed cases, we have to think about how effectively we can uh, respond to those cases within the overall system. As Dr. Kim said in the beginning, 
Most of the patients were admitted to the hospitals in the beginning of the outbreak. However, the hospitals had to be uh, running out of the beds because of that. So triage as a system was introduced in order to identify the severe cases and the milder cases are sent to the living uh, treatment center so they can stay there and be cared by medical staff who check their health system or the health status one or two times a day. I think this kind of a system can be built from the learning. We learn from the MERS incidents, but at the same time, as we respond against the corona pandemic or the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic, we are uh, doing by learning. So in responding against this one, and actually we temporarily also introduced the telemedicine as a practice. That's what we do in Korea. So the next presenter will be talking about the countries with the insufficient medical resources, how those countries can prepare and respond against the COVID-19 pandemic. The next speaker is Professor Moran Kim from the uh, National Cancer Center. Hello, I am Moran Ki from National Cancer Center. My topic today is COVID-19 pandemic preparedness and response in countries with insufficient medical resources. I will go over the COVID-19 pandemic situation and its epidemiological characteristics, preparedness and response, and how to utilize R to reduce cases. First, the pandemic situation. As you know, with the number of the confirmed cases around the world rising, the pandemic situation is being aggravated. On this graph, the x-axis represents the total confirmed cases and the y-axis shows total confirmed death. So, you can see countries with high number of the confirmed cases and deaths on the upper right part, such as 20% of the fatality rate for France and more than 1 million confirmed cases for U.S. This is an epidemic curve from WHO. Epidemic curve for global confirmed cases over time on the upper part shows that the pandemic is still ongoing. Epidemic curve for death on the lower part seems to decrease. However, it's still too early to say that. Next is the epidemiological characteristics of COVID-19. I made my first presentation on COVID-19 on the 21st of January. At the time, confirmed case count in China was 218, Japan 1, Korea 1, and Thailand 2. Five days after that, the total confirmed case increased to 2,800, and after another five days, on 31st of January, it rose to 9,800 around the globe. The number of countries with the confirmed cases also increased rapidly. This is outbreak timeline. If you look at the timeline, as shown in the map on this slide, globally, the first COVID case, COVID-19 case, was confirmed in China, and the red area expanded to other areas too. On the 30th of January, WHO declared a pay, and on March 11th, declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic situation. This is the epidemiological characteristics of the early 28 cases in Korea, which I published in a journal. As you can see, the index case from Wuhan led to the first and the second generation of infections. However, not just the Wuhan, but infection from Guangdong 
also led to the first generation infection and a patient came to Korea after being infected in Japan and caused the second generation infection here in Korea. Besides, infection was caused by people who visited the Thailand and by people who participated in an academic conference held in Singapore. Table 1 on the right shows important index on epidemiological characteristics. Production number or R at the early stage was about 0.5. Serial interval was about 6 days, and incubation period was about 3 days. This slide shows for 28 patients data such as when they arrived in Korea, when the symptoms started to be displayed, and when they are tested positive, isolated, and treated, and when contacts with others were made. For further details, you can download the paper for free at the URL of the OI here. This is from KCDC's paper, which was published after about 7,000 people were confirmed. Here you can see the date of onset and the date of diagnosis. During the days when we had 28 confirmed cases, daily new case count was 1, and R was was about 0.5 on February 18, the patient 31st was confirmed. But as you can see, on that day, by date of onset, there were many patients already. To be more accurate, about 1,000 people were suspected to have symptoms already at that time. So, although the number of confirmed cases increased exponentially after that time, it was more of finding patients who already had symptoms. Korea is well known for the expanded testing. Here you can see the number of the tests per day and positive rate. This curve shows a positive rate, and in early days, people with symptoms were tested more, and therefore, positive rate was high enough to reach 10%. After that, people without symptoms and those who contacted the infected persons were tested too, so positive rate is lower to the current level of 1 to 2%. The number of the tests per day also decreased from almost 20,000 to somewhere between 4,000 and 5,000 now. So all in all, 645,000 people were tested and 10,000 of them found to be positive, so the positive rate is about 1.7%. And this shows how much time has passed from the onset of symptoms to diagnosis. In early days of the outbreak, from onset to diagnosis, some patients took lots of time. But as time passed, diagnosis and testing was done very quickly in one or two days. This represents duration. From the onset to confirm four days, from the onset to death about 10 days, from the onset to discharge about 12.5 days. For early symptoms, fever, cough, sore throat, Myalgia and chills were known to be the common ones, but later, loss of taste and smell was reported by many patients. This to the question of if they felt early symptoms, 19% said no. 
Best shows cases by clusters. Of the total confirmed cases, about half are related to a religious sect called Shincheonji Church. About 5,200 patients are in this cluster. Other than that, people related to hospitals, healthcare facilities, or other collective facilities, or those who got infected through contacts with the uh, patients are also infected in community. They account for 31% of the total. Outside of the community spread, 12% are international arrivals and their families. And it's not still clear about their source of infection for, for 900 or 9% of the patients. By sex, and age, the female patients outnumber male patients with 40.5% and 60% respectively, and interestingly, people in 20s are the largest group by age, and that is followed by people in 50s and 60s, and median age of the patient population is 44 years old. This is case fatality uh, rate, CFR, the x-axis represent the age daily death toll and accumulated death toll. As of the 5th of May, 255 patients died, recording CFR of 2.36%. But by age, although patients in 20s are the largest group, there are no deaths under the age of 30 in Korea. So the median age of the deceased patient is 79 years old. When it comes to the epidemiology of infection, incubation and latent periods are very important. I always highlight that respiratory and gastrointestinal infections are very different. Among others, the x-axis here is time and the y-axis is severity. In respiratory infection, early in infection, viral shedding occurs, but patients display no symptoms. And after the onset of symptoms, pathogen is still discharged. Symptoms remain even after viral shedding is over. So for respiratory infection during the latent period where there is no symptom, infection occurs. This is an important characteristic of respiratory infection which makes it difficult to manage. On the other hand, for gastrointestinal infection, after some time from infection, patients start to display symptoms, but there is no virus shedding. But however, even after symptoms subside, pathogen can still be discharged. So it is important to manage infected patients while in the convalescent stage. COVID-19 is very unique. It represents and it presents both characteristics of respiratory and gastrointestinal infections. So once infected, before symptoms are developed, pathogen starts to be discharged. This is the characteristic of respiratory infection. But at the same time, after symptoms are gone, pathogen is still being discharged. This is the characteristic of gastrointestinal infection. So presenting both characteristics, COVID-19 is really difficult to manage. This is a mode of transmission for communicable infectious disease, mainly direct, direct contact and indirect contact. The infections can be transmitted through these channels. Droplets are most common channel of transmission for the respiratory infection, more direct contact or biological vectors, mosquitoes may not be the case, albeit not clear yet. Potentially, animals like pangolin, pangolin may transmit the virus. Besides, although we believe air is not the case, but in a special setting, such as hospitals, droplet nuclei may transmit the virus. Another one is a common vehicle. For example, person with respiratory infection 
collection cups or the food and the spread, respiratory secretion or it, and if others eat it, then they can be infected too. And another case can be a doorknob. This is a doorknob. If a patient grabs it with contaminated hands, and those who grab this doorknob afterwards may also be infected. So the various transmission modes here, most of them can apply to the COVID-19 infection. The most major mode of transmission is this droplet because it creates and disperses a lot of droplets. Droplet. That's why we have to use good cough etiquette and wear face mask. For another indicator, depending on the symptom onset or its severity, infectivity, heart pathogenicity, and virulence rates are calculated. Usually, uh, diseases are classified into three classes of A, B, and C. For example, TB is, uh, has many inapparent infections, followed by mild, moderate, and severe. It's a class A. Uh, class B includes measles, where inapparent infection is very rare, some mild, mostly moderate, and some severe and fatal. And rabies has no inapparent, no mild, no mild, and no moderate infection, mostly severe, and 90% of the patients die, so its fatality rate is really high. Then where does COVID-19 belong? None of them. It's different. COVID-19 has inapparent infection, about 10%. And noticeably, it has many mild cases, about 80%. It also has moderate, severe, and fatal cases, although varying from one country to another. The fatal rate is about between like 2 to 10%. So clinical diseases, mostly, most of them are frequent but mild, and deaths are not many but high in old ages. That's the characteristic of the COVID-19. As said, there are so many mild cases, so it's not easy to hospitalize all of them. For in apparent or mild cases, patients are isolated, but not in hospitals, but in treatment centers that are quasi-home and quasi-hospital for three weeks or two weeks after symptoms subside. Moderate cases mean patients requiring oxygen therapy. Severe cases require mechanical ventilation or ECMO hospitalized in ICU. They are severe cases. For moderate criteria, high risk group and special and situation, you can refer to this slide. Second is COVID-19, preparedness and response. We generally mention three infectious disease control principles. First is management of pathogen and reservoir, block the infection transmission process, and manage the host. In the management of pathogen and reservoir, as is most obvious, is to disinfect or in order to prevent transmission, kill, the transmitter or isolate the patient and provide treatment. Also, the most important factor, and I will have to skip this part, but in order for us to block the infection transmission process, um, what is important is quarantine and isolation. At this time, quarantine is for the context or risk people, and isolation is for the infectious subject, the patient. The major driving factor of infectious disease is nutritional status, personal hygiene, public sanitation, overall health, and social status. What is to note is that there is bi-directional causality. With the rise of poverty, the prevalence of infectious diseases increases. Reversely, when there is higher prevalence of infectious diseases, poverty also increases, so there is a vicious cycle.
Then, what is the role of public health in dealing with infectious diseases? There are three that we can consider. First is improving the resistance of the host. Second is to improve environmental safety. Third is to improve and reinforce the public health systems. In COVID-19 preparedness, as was just before mentioned, we must improve our public health systems, have universal health coverage, have laws established for communicable disease prevention and control, strengthen human resources, and have measures to prevent hospital infections, have intersectoral coordination and collaboration, and establish risk communication. These are all very important factors. Risk communication is one of the very important factors, so I would like to emphasize risk communication. When we mention risk, it is a combination of hazard and outrage. For example, if there is high hazard but low outrage, we must tell people to watch out and be more careful. In a situation where outrage is high but hazard is low, then we must calm people down. However, if both hazard and outrage are high, what should we do? We must be good at crisis communication. We must develop a sense of solidarity and give people this message that we can overcome this crisis together. One of the most important principles of risk communication is to send a key message out that national infection prevention can be completed through the participation of the public and we can overcome this together and we can have campaigns, for example, thanks to campaign for medical personnel. In Korea, we have a thanks to challenge, which is a part of this effort. We must also think of the vulnerable groups when we communicate. For example, they can be groups that use a different language. So we must also take those groups into consideration. Recently, we also saw infodemics, which is wrong risk communication examples. There was wrong information disseminated about alcohol, and people thought that alcohol can cure people, which led people to death. There was a case in Korea as well when at, at a church they sprayed salt water into worshippers' mouths, saying that this will prevent infection, and due to this, several dozen of patients were infected. Second is response. There are two types, responses to reduce incidents and responses to reduce fatalities. Responses to reduce fatalities will be covered by the next professor, and that will be treatment. So I will focus my talk mostly on responses to reduce incidents. We generally categorize them into two phases. The containment phase is according to WHO Scenario 2, countries with sporadic cases, and in this case, personal protection, environmental protection, and social protection. Social distancing is implemented. Quarantine, isolation, closed child care facilities and schools can be considered. However, when there are mo more patients, if it escalates to WHO Scenario 3 or 4, we need to consider a mitigation phase. At this stage, personal protection and environmental protection are the same, but social protection level, social distancing becomes much more reinforced. That is why there is quarantine of all contacts. All patients, regardless of whether their symptoms are mild or severe, must all be isolated and contact must be blocked. At this time, child care facilities and schools must be closed, and at workplaces, there must be flexible change of working hours or work-at-home programs or have teleconferencing and change to a non-contact or contactless society. Most of the group events must be canceled or postponed. Traffic movement control can be considered as well. In Korea, you can see some pictures showing importance of personal protection equipment. This is a mask, and the baby is so cute, but the mask is too big, too big, so we can only see the eyes through the eye holes that have been made. 
You can see uh, washing hands, and this is from the U.S. If you need a mask in a hurry, but you don't have one, you can see that you can make one from a T-shirt. To show social distancing, this picture shows that although you are physically apart, you can be close at heart. This is also a campaign. In personal protection, they say that facial masks are not familiar to people in the U.S. or in Europe. But 100 years ago, during the flu pandemic, when you see the pictures that were taken at that, at that time, it looks very familiar. The policeman is giving a warning that if you don't wear a mask, you will go to jail. In order to buy a mask, people are waiting in a line in front of a pharmacy. It looks similar to what happened in Korea recently. Next is using reproductive numbers, R, to reduce cases. A lot of time has passed, so I will quickly cover this part. As you are all aware, the reproductive rate refers to the average number of new infections caused by one infected individual. We say R0 equals PCD. P stands for probability of transmission per contact. C stands for contacts per unit time and D stands for duration of infectiousness. R is determined through these three factors. Then, R needs to be less than one for us to manage the infection. So we must reduce P, C, and D so that R will be reduced to less than one. These are the ways to reduce the PCD. To reduce P, in the case of sexually transmitted diseases, you could use a condom. In COVID-19, you can use masks, goggles, or gloves, exercise cough etiquette, and have physical distancing. To reduce contact, we implement social distancing, and to reduce the duration of the infectious period, what we do is active testing so that we can isolate the people uh, that have been infected. Then we can use the R to make a mathematical model. Why do we need to make a mathematical model? I think mathematical models are receiving the most attention nowadays around the world. Through mathematical models, we can understand the system of transmission of infections in a population and help interpret observed epidemiological trends, identify key determinants, collect data, and make predictions for the future and evaluate the potential impact of diverse policies and interventions. There are many different types of mathematical modeling, but one of the most widely used is a deterministic model. Probabilistic models can also be used as well. Using the deterministic model that I used and utilizing this, a mathematical model is predicting what will happen in Korea. Please refer to this link for the paper in full. Let me briefly cover the results. Several scenario assumptions were made. If there was no intervention at all, how many confirmed cases would exist and until when the pandemic will last? We saw that most of the people living in Daegu, Gyeongbuk region, 4.99 million people would all be infected and the infection would be concluded near the end of June. Then, in each situation, we saw what would happen if the transmission rate was reduced. You can see the last scenario, number 5, was most fitting with our data, and the transmission rate was reduced to 75%, and the patient within two days of infection was found by the national authorities through active tests. When this took place, there would be 800 patients on a peak day, and on May 1st, there would be about one patient per day, and it was found that the infection would be managed and controlled with 10,000 confirmed cases. You can see the epidemic curve for each scenario. This refers to the numbers of all cumulative patients, and this is a calculation of the R. We found out the case in Korea, and you can see in China it went to 4.0, but in Korea it was about 
0.5. We used this data and we calculated the different scenarios. When the transmission rate was high and the transmission duration was high, obviously R would get higher. And this is a graph showing that we need to reduce both for R to go down. This is when there is a weakening of social distancing and how many patients can be increased. This is a simulation and the date was simulated as of April 30th and we on had another simulation on May 1st so that we can see when there was a reduction of social distancing and weakening how many patients can increase. This was to remind people to be more careful. Please refer to this in your spare time. This is a summary to cover what we know about COVID-19, this is what we summarize. It is highly infectious, R is between 3 and 4. The fatality is not high for young people, but there is a very high fatality for the aged. Transmission occurs in the subclinical stage. Trace, taste, and isolation during the infectious period is effective in reducing transmission. Social distancing can stop infection transmission. Face mask and hand sanitizers need to continuously be used. We say there is no vaccine, but cheering and encouraging can act as vaccines. However, we also see many issues and challenges. In order to manage this disease, we must review and revise the surveillance system and guidelines for health care facilities. Second, in each country, there are many cases when acts must be revised and laws must be revised or established to be prepared for and to respond to infectious diseases. It is also the same for Korea as well. We must also think about how to strike the right balance between privacy and social protection. Third, is for us to set strategies to deal with reducing crowding problems, in particular in long-term care facilities, religious facilities, entertainment facilities, and in schools. We need to think about how we can reduce the crowding problems. Fourth is, for each country, we realize that we have a shortage of human resources from this opportunity. We must foster medical human resources, and we have used many aggressive policies and interventions, so we must evaluate the effectiveness of these policies. Fifth is risk communication and international solidarity. COVID-19 crisis is ongoing around the world. However, I believe that it can also be an opportunity for us to have health system reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Moran Keys uh, talked about how fast the COVID-19 virus can spread and thinking about its epidemiological characteristics, what kind of the responses will be uh, better suit to work on the situation, and particularly for the low- and middle-income countries, what kind of the preparations need to be made? For example, uh, we need to have the legislative foundation, and also the care for the vulnerables is needed, and the healthcare uh, system and healthcare medical staff and their protections are also important. So thank you again. Now we will move to the Q&A session. We received some questions advance, in advance and also received some questions online. We may not be able to deal with all the questions because of the time constraint. I think one or two to three questions will be answered by each speaker. So, following the order of the questions that we just received, uh, I will share the questions. So, Director General uh, Son will answer the questions first. 
The first question, actually, I will just go over the question first. So what are the most important infection prevention and control policy to consider? And the second question is that in Korea, uh, with the shift to the distancing in daily life, the number of the confirmed cases is on the rise. So how can we cope with it? And what about the third question is about the uh, cost, how to allocate the budget between the government? to treat them. So the first question is, the, what are the most important infection prevention and control policy to consider? Well, there are many different prevention and control policies, so it may not be easy to pick just one or two. But if you think about the COVID-19 characteristics, asymptomatic uh, patients are many, and it's very strong in terms of spreading the virus when there is no or mild symptoms. So testing is really important. Rigorous testing should be done in order to identify uh, patients with no symptoms so that they need to be isolated early on. So testing capacity is really important. And second is that we need to conduct the epidemiological investigation in order to isolate the contacts when the uh, cases are increasing rapidly in a densely populated area. Many cases, people just give up on the epidemiological investigation. However, if you think about the speed of the spread this time, we have to focus on and keep going, uh, carrying on with the epidemiological investigation in order to slow down the spread. And social distancing, of course, is important. At the same time, many countries should think about this. When the spread is uh, very strong, there are many patients with mild symptoms. About 90% of the patients in Korea have mild symptoms, so they do not need hospitalization. So if the country accommodates all these patients to the hospitals, then the hospital resources will be running out and the medical staff are, uh, are more likely to be affected. So the system itself can collapse. So we need to think about how to accommodate those mild cases. We utilize the training centers or other the community centers in the community. We convert them or repurpose them so that they serve as the uh, living treatment center. So I think there can be many different approaches. For example, one country, let's say if that country does not have the strong testing competency, then they need to be more creative, meaning that rather than focusing on people with symptoms, uh, they just treat them as patients from the very beginning and focus their testing competencies on the people with uh, no symptoms, who they uh, did it, I guess. So depending on the competencies and the resources, I think the countries have to think about how they uh, select and focus those resources on certain areas. Thank you very much. The second question is that recently, um, the Korea is moving to the distancing in daily life, so the number of the confirmed cases is on the rise again. Uh, the, number of the, the number of the confirmed cases, cases, is, on the cases is on the rise again. So how will how you cope, cope with this? this? I think we have to see the trends because it's still early in distancing in daily life. Moving to the distancing in daily life actually encompasses such risk. In Korea, the clubs uh, became the starting point for the cluster infection. We were not able to think about the clubs in the beginning. However, as we move to the distancing in, social, uh, in daily lives, it is quite natural to have uh, the confirmed cases more in our society. And actually, the pandemic is underway, and actually, until the vaccine uh, to be developed, this will go on. And during that period, we just cannot lock down all the economic activities. If we do so, then the lower income household will suffer more and other social issues will arise. So to a certain point of uh, extent, we have to take some risk and meanwhile we also open the uh, businesses.
and also focus on our uh, disease prevention and control efforts. And that's what we do in distancing in daily lives. What we try to focus on here is that we try to maintain the level of the confirmed cases, the newly confirmed cases, uh, to the level that the uh, Korean health system can deal with. So by doing so, we can open the society and we can uh, leave our routines. At the same time, uh, we can control the disease. Uh, currently, the daily uh, new confirmation is about 30, so we have to see whether we uh, this level can be maintained or not. So uh, the public have to comply with the uh, distancing policies and guidelines in daily Life so that they can slow down the spread, uh, washing hands, wearing facial masks, and also keep some distance from others, and uh, open the windows in buildings. So by doing so, we can reduce the scope of spread. And second is the surveillance system. In many areas, including hospitals and the facilities for the seniors, and also the military, we we put our testing competencies in order to uh, have the early detection. So by utilizing this kind of a surveillance, when we have a outbreak, we would try to detect such incidents early on. And when we identify that, we have to conduct the epidemiological investigation as fast as possible so that we can stem the spread of such cluster infection so that they can stop in a small, at a small scale. So while we are doing these three steps repeatedly, and at the same time, we do our businesses and uh, practice our economic activities, then we can uh, maintain a very good uh, infection in, uh, prevention and control. By utilizing this system, and we also have to see one or two weeks from now on in order to see how stable uh, we can leave the uh, distancing in our daily lives or move to the previous uh, social distancing. We have to see it one or two weeks. Thank you very much. Disease control in daily life. Well, you mentioned that it is not just to cut down the number of confirmed cases to zero, but it is to actually have the level go down to a level where our hospitals can accommodate the patients and maintain a controllable level. I will ask the third question. In the case of Korea, well, is the government responsible for all the expenses at the quarantine center? Or how to allocate the budget between the central government and the local government? So um, it was about budget allocation. the expenses at quarantine center? Or how to allocate uh, the budget between the central and local government and, and the, the personal public as well? Well, I think actually this these are two questions in one. Regarding the um, quarantine center, or, uh, well, it is jointly paid by the central government and the local autonomous government. So mostly borne by the central government and 10 to 20 percent by the local government. So when the patient is isolated and uh, receives treatment, I think I think you also wanted to know about who pays for the treatment, and it is actually free. We have the national health insurance system in Korea, so the health insurance will actually cover the patient's treatment fees, so the patients do not have to pay. For the patients in Korea, for diagnosis and treatment, they don't have to pay from their own pockets. Just to elaborate on that note, uh, regarding not only the living treatment centers, the quarantine centers and others, I know that the government actually compensates them for their economic losses during the quarantine period. In Korea, we tell the contacts that they uh, must be quarantined for 14 days. So if they come in contact with a pa patient, confirmed patient, then they must be in self-isolation or quarantine for 14 days. 
This means that people actually uh, cannot go to work and they cannot make an economic living. This means that uh, we will give them a amount of money which is actually higher than the low, uh, minimum wage, so about um, in between the median wage as well. So um, at their workplaces, um, the workplaces can also compensate the patients or for those in quarantine uh, for their time in the facility. So I would like to direct the next question to Professor Hong. And in the 21st century, Northeast Asia experienced major outbreaks such as SARS, H1N1, and MERS. So according to the NIID of Japan, Korea had three confirmed cases and no death and during the SARS outbreak, uh, there were 257 deaths. Uh, so what this asks is uh, whether it is fair to say that Korea started to develop and make preparations for PCR testing after 2009 and 2015. But in the case of Korea, there is no death during SARS, but outbreak uh, with mortality in H1N1 and, and, and MERS. So the question is, is it fair to say uh, that Korea started to develop and make uh, preparations for PCR testing after 2009 or 2015? Yeah. Well, that's not the case. Actually, even before that, the molecular assay was widely used in Korea already. But as we move to the 21st century, uh, the large outbreak of the uh, diseases that you just mentioned uh, made us a lot of uh, suffering. So, but there were some issues like the uh, reagents and others. So, areas for further improvement have been uh, studied and uh, improvements were made uh, during those pandemics. And actually the quality of the testing uh, is quite good in Korea even before that. And molecular stay has been used quite a lot in Korea. And as we experienced uh, different pandemics, uh, the assays the has been uh, further sophisticated. Thank you. So what we're saying is that Korea has been preparing for this quite a long time ago. The second question is about the diverse PCR test methods, and it's about the effectiveness and the validity, because there are some false negatives and false positives. And in some cases, people are tested PCR negative, but after doing LGM tests, they can be deemed positive. So can you explain more about this? the uh, different PCR tests in terms of false positive, false negative, and also the interpretation of uh, the results among people who have PCR negative tests and, and further procedures with, with those people. Well, let me answer the first question. In many different kits, they show false negatives, false positives, sensitivity, and specificity. And for us, we need to use the tests, we need to use the kits that have high specificity and have good accuracy, and only those are used in Korea. I cannot tell you um, exact in exact terms, but it is within 1 to 2 percent of false negative and false positive, and this needs to be done for us to have an accurate test results. So that could actually hinge upon the quality of the kit. And in the case of IgM antibody that's positive and where there is negative result for PCR, in those cases, I think that we can uh, see the results as they are. But as was just mentioned, if the, there could be false positives and false negatives, as you mentioned. For example, if the patient, after the drug is administered, they could have a lower viral load. And in some cases, there could be less viruses, insufficient virus, viruses in the specimens. In other cases, 
there could be some kind of cross reaction. So that is why we need to look at all the different results. As I explained in my presentation, retests are absolutely important. And if you believe the test results are accurate, then I believe that if there are no clinical symptoms, you would not need to have other tests done. Thank you very much. So the next question is that what is the quality assurance method for the uh, COVID-19 testing? Well, when it comes to the quality uh, control or the assurance, actually the internal quality control and also there are also the external quality control. So we have two different modes. Uh, for the internal quality control QC, the test the analysts always check the quality of the testing in order to identify if there is any abnormalities. Laboratory diagnostic guideline uh, details the, uh, the how we do it. And I actually mentioned about it during the presentation. The second one is different. External quality control is a bit different because they're here, the blind test is being done. So the accredited uh, organization uh, conduct the blind testing by providing negative and positive materials all together. And the testing organization or the testing lab should be able to produce the uh, concrete and accurate result. So the external quality assurance program should be run well and all the testing labs should participate in this kind of an external QC program. That's important. Thank you. So for the internal quality assurance and also for the external quality assurance, you are, what you're saying is that we need to have both, right? Yes. I would like to now direct questions to Professor Kim, Kim Uisok. So the first question is uh, whether you have a special working system um, that is uh, just for the professionals working in the hospital, and if you have any monitoring for convalescent patients uh, convalescing at home. And uh, have you done any type of care or home monitoring for convalescent patients? In our hospital, we need to consider that the numbers of patients can increase. So we believe that training is very important for our medical staff. We receive volunteers or we designate the staff um, who will be devoted to the treatment of COVID-19 patients, and we are training them. Especially wearing personal protective equipment is very important, and the proper way to wear them is very important. So we are actually given very intensive training. When the COVID-19 um, patients are treated by our medical staff, uh, they are monitored uh, in their gowning and degowning with the protective suits and equipment, and we also monitor them to see that they are not exposed to the virus. And if there are symptoms such as respiratory symptoms or fever, we would, of course, monitor them. And if they have the symptoms, then we would have PCR tests right away and ban them from their work immediately. And if we believe that they are exposed to risks, then in most cases, we would actually have them stay at home in isolation for two weeks. I believe that sufficient training and getting enough manpower high quality human resources is most important and we can actually encounter COVID-19 patients at any time so that is why we need to actually foster our HR pool when the patients recover in the hospital well after they are discharged from the hospital uh, we actually don't monitor them and they are mo monitored by the public health center and in most cases although it is not in law we asked the patients to convale at convalesce at home for about two weeks at home in isolation, and we asked them uh, to be monitored from the public health center to see if they develop symptoms. Thank you. The second question is that what kind of PPE are being used to take samples? For example, swab. What sort of PPE that are being used to take samples? 
Um, I think uh, it can be an issue for the countries with insufficient medical resources. In taking samples, uh, what is important is that what is the most important thing is that the aerosols will be induced because aerosols have a high level of the transmission risk, and therefore the PPE are very important. So at my hospital, usually in the take, in taking samples, N95 respirators need to be used, and also facial shields or the goggles are also used in order to the infection on the uh, muscles, and also the uh, disposable gowns and the gloves are used in order to prevent the possibility of being exposed to aerosols or the droplets. But in other procedures with without aerosols, meaning like taking care of the patients, the medical staff are wearing surgical masks. Most of the healthcare uh, facilities in Korea for the uh, suspected cases, strongly suspected carry, uh, cases, and 95 uh, respirators, and also all the other uh, the PPE, the stronger PPEs are used. So when you do some procedures that can induce the aerosol and 95 mask uh, and other high level of the PPP need to be used to protect yourself. Thank you. And now I would like to direct questions to Professor Morang Ki. In Korea, I know that tracking is being very well done in Korea. So we also call this contact training. And um, there was a question about the epidemiological surveillance and investigation. How is it being done in more detail? For the epidemiological investigation, after doing the test and when we see a confirmed uh, case, we tra trace them because of two reasons. First is to block the transmission by the patient. Second is to know when, where and how this uh, patient was exposed so that we can actually block further transmission. In doing the contact tracing, a traditional way is to have interview with the confirmed patient. So there would be a period of time uh, needed. And in Korea, we would start the tracing from two days before the symptoms start to develop to their isolation period and to know where, where the patient contacted the disease. We also need to find out uh, where the patient was and who the patient met in 14 days in the latent period. So we actually have a daily log for the confirmed patients. So there is a list of the people and places that the confirmed patient met. However, it is a very long time period. and. It's very hard for people to remember, and in some cases, they don't want to mention where they were or who they met, so it may not be perfect. So we cannot rely on the interview alone, so we use other ancillary ways, for example, for example, if there are CCTV cameras at the place uh, where the patient was, we would actually uh, see the footage and we would also see, in some cases, uh, the phone uh, coverage and if the patient was using a car, then we would actually see where they were with a GPS. And if the patients actually uh, were treated at a medical facility, then we would get the information from the National Health Insurance Company of Korea. And in many cases, Koreans use credit cards often. So we would actually make inquiries into uh, where the person used the credit card and that would tell us the whereabouts of the patient during that latent period. After we have the daily log of the patient, then there would be specific uh, places, for example, restaurant A. Then there would be contacts made at that restaurant that we need to find. 
What we would do is we would make inquiries into the credit card information of the people that were in the same place at the same time, and we would also see the CCTV footage in the restaurant to see who was there at what time. So we would see if this person exposed other people to the disease. If this is an insufficient, we would use the IC system of Korea and we would we could actually get a list of all the people in a certain area during a certain period of time from all teleco telco carriers and get their phone numbers. However, we could also miss some people using all of these measures. So what happens is in Korea, we would actually disclose to the Korean people the whereabouts of the patient. And if the Korean people actually see the whereabouts, then um, they would see if they were in the same place at the same time and they would actually be involved in self-isolation and uh, be tested as quickly as possible. Of course, there is a risk of, of privacy infringement in this type of tracing. For example, if we had five confirmed cases in Korea today, then uh, we would actually disclose the whereabouts or the tracing results of all five patients so that we can actually try to make it more anonymous and after 14 days, uh, we would actually remove the information because it would not be needed and the epidemiological investigator would actually make a judgment about whether to disclose a place or not. And when disclosing a place helps to find context, then we would make the decision to disclose the place. And if needed, we would actually not disclose other information about about the individual and their where and their whereabouts when we find that it is not needed for us to find a further context. In the case of Korea, we have all of this uh, that is legal and bound in our laws. So for the contact tracing and surveillance system, uh, details were shared and all the sections are taken on the legal basis. So without the legal basis, those kind of actions cannot be taken. And of the questions that we talked about, actually the local governments, the countries with the strong lo local government systems, may have some different aspect, meaning that there can be some strength or the weakness because that country has a strong local government. In many countries, the public health and the, uh, the infectious diseases management are done by the local government. That is because uh, when the infectious diseases start to spread in the local areas, the local government can be better positioned in quickly responding to it. But for COVID-19, which is very uh, fast and spreading, and uh, where there are many uncertainties, the local government need to work together with the central government. I think that one of the key to Korea's success, success here is that the strong cooperation between the public and the uh, private sectors, and also the uh, cooperation between the central and the local governments. The central government with the KCDC, the technical lead is taken by KCDC and the government, the central government, and the local government follows those guidelines together well, so we can have the nationwide responses against the disease very effectively. But in some countries, for example, uh, as in the case of the Pakistan, the devolution in the uh, government system is, the, is very strong. So the state uh, body for health has a lot of uh, power, so it's good in some sense. But at the same time, when the country has a, a huge outbreak of the infectious diseases like this one, then the cooperation between the central government and the local government is really important and necessary. And we do have the uh, legal foundation in Korea after the MERS outbreak. Uh, 
In times of the crisis, because of the disease, the central government can exercise more authority than before. Uh, because we do have some more time, I want to ask another question to Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim. This question is about the relapse cases. Among the treated and cured cases, uh, if yes, what is the cause of the relapse? So this is about the relapse cases, whether we do have the relapse cases or not. I think we need to uh, make some definition here. When we say the relapse cases, it means that the viruses are reactivated in patients. Or sometimes patients do not have the immune Im immunity here. So the SARS uh, coronavirus 2 can be exposed to that patient again. So kind of a reinfection. So whether it is a reinfection or the relapse, there are so many uh, discussions on the way. In many other countries, RT-PCR two uh, negative uh, negative result two times in a row, but after one or two weeks, then comes again uh, with a positive result. This kind of the cases are reported in other countries too. According to the Korean CDC, out of 9,600, about 400 people reported uh, reactivation in RCR. And of that 29, uh, patients, specimen, or viruses from those cases were uh, cultured, but no negative, no positive there again. So we also conducted, uh, conducted the contact tracing, and there was no second generation infection from that cases. What I'm trying to say here is that the living virus can remain, or the reactivation can be done, and the second generation uh, infection can be done. Those kind of things didn't happen. That's because the virus is not the living ones, that they are only the dead particles. I think the experts are talking about this possibility so far. Of course, we need to study further and we need to accumulate more data on this matter, but so far, the latent infection, the virus does not cause, cause latent infection. So epithelium uh, cells in the upper respiratory tract can come out because of other infection of the respiratory virus, other viruses. That might be one of the reasons why we do see some positive results from um, the, the test. So we need to study further on this one. So when we have the uh, relapse case, but that does not mean that it causes issue or the risk in the community, that uh, that risk level is very low. Thank you very much. You have mentioned that even if there is another positive result, then it will have low possibility of being spreading to the society in the community. The next question is about Korea's ICT, which is well known for being very advanced. And I know that it is playing a big role in your response to COVID-19. The role of the information and communication technology in the Korea's successful response to COVID-19, please. Yeah. Regarding the utilization of IT technology, there are many positive factors and advantages. In Korea, it is mainly being used in four ways. First is epidemiological investigation, and as was mentioned by Professor Ki, it is to trace the contacts and we can actually trace the credit card information or um, their movements through CCTV as well. So it helps us in getting information more accurately and in a shorter, shorter amount of time. It also helps in isolation and quarantine. This is not just limited to Korea. It is also used in Singapore and other countries. And in the case of Korea, we have a self-isolation app that can be downloaded and it can also have a GPS tracing. So if the quarantined uh, individual leaves a certain area, then we can trace them. And regarding the status, health status of the patient, we can also manage this through the self app, especially for the people that are incoming to Korea. It is very efficient for us to trace this information because when foreigners come into Korea, 
well, they might not have any symptoms during the quarantine period when they come in, well, they can develop some symptoms later on. So in Korea, we have the Health Management Act that is mandatory for the foreigners coming into Korea to be downloaded onto their smartphones and every two times a day they need to monitor their health to see whether they will develop symptoms and if they check that they are developed symptoms then uh, this will be sent to the central management center and we would give them information about them getting uh, the tests and give them other information. Fourth is uh, in a simple treatment, ICT is used as well. I mentioned the living treatment centers beforehand, and for the patients with mild symptoms, they can actually uh, be isolated there, and we use the minimal amount of resources to manage them at this area. And in the case of patients with mild symptoms, they also need to manage their health. So in some living treatment centers, ICT was used. So there were some health management apps that could be loaded, downloaded into smartphones and from large hospitals. Through ICT technology, we could provide consulting to the patients living in the living treatment centers uh, by the doctors at the larger hospitals. So ICT technology is uh, to be lauded for its accuracy and speed. In particular for disease control, if we have less administrative personnel or whether when we have less uh, professionals who can cover certain patients, it could work very positively in our favor. However, we need to take precaution because it can actually infringe on the privacy information of individuals. So we need to think about what is the right balance of having uh, privacy protection of individuals and having this type of information for the public. In Korea, uh, we can get approval by um, asking the public and also have different legislations on the table at the National Congress. And for COVID-19, it is true that IT technologies are being developed and Korea is revising uh, many methods. So we need to think about how to strike the right balance between privacy protection and the public good. So the ICT is important, but it does not solve all the issues. And we need to have and secure the legit legitimacy of the procedures, and it should be based on the uh, legal foundation. We have invited four experts today to share Korean experience and also the considerations that we have been making here, including the public health policy and other policies too uh, can be implemented differently, can produce different results depending on the situation among different countries. So Korean experience may not be 100% applicable to your countries. However, what we have thought and what we have considered can be a good resources for the uh, learning among ourselves. The Korean uh, policies against the COVID-19, I think the transparency and democratic values are very important. So we have, we have maintained democratic values and also became transparent. We didn't seal off the country and did not control the borders. But at the same time, we also achieved some results. Of course, technology played a role. However, I think the dedication from the uh, medical community and the government competence and also the tr trust from the public are the key factors to the Korean case. What I'm trying to say is that the trust and social capital are really important in effectively responding to the infectious disease. If you think about the characteristics of the pandemic, the, we have to make good efforts and produce good results, not just in one country, but also in all of our countries. We have to work together in order to win over the war against the COVID-19 
And I think this is only the start. So we have to work together very closely and bend together so that we can overcome this crisis. Thank you.